Well, thank you, John. Amen. Appreciate you and your team uh, sharing with us today. Those of you that are worshiping with us, I encourage you to take your Bible and go to the book of Luke, chapter 24. We've just finished up uh, what I have called the 20 days of prayer leading up to this day, Easter 2020, and we finished early this morning with uh, sunrise as we open the Word of God, look together for a few moments, and then we come to Easter morning worship. And thank you for being with us uh, as we share the Word of God together this day. We're in Luke 24, and I want to begin reading in verse 1 and read the first 12 verses, Luke 24. You follow along in your copy of the Word of God. The Bible says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. But Peter. Oh yeah. The one that had denied the Lord had heard these words of resurrection and verse 12 says, but Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Now dear friends, the issue today is not this empty room, but rather the issue is an empty tomb. He is not there because he has risen from the dead. Now this year, this room is empty and you are at home for this service. But this is not the first time it happened this way. For you see right here in this text, Peter had gone to the tomb. He stooped and looked in. He saw only the linen that had held his Lord there, and he was gone. And the Bible says Peter went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. So you see, you're not the first one to spend Easter morning at home. Peter was the first one to be at home for Easter. He went back to his house and he was marveling at what he had seen <laughs> and what he had not seen. He saw the linen, he saw the raw rock rolled away, but he did not see the body of Jesus. And he went home and he marveled as he thought about the doctrine of the resurrection. For you see, friend, the resurrection, the doctrine of it in Scripture is the life changer. It is the linchpin of all theology. Either Jesus rose from the dead, and we are followers of a living Christ, or it's all a hope. He's dead to this day, and he's just one like everyone else. But we that follow Christ, that resurrection doctrine, that 
is the life changer. And it was in all of the Word of God. In Romans chapter 6 and verse number 5, So we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death. Certainly we shall be in the likeness of His what? His resurrection. Philippians 3 and verse number 10, That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection as well as the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. And all through the book of Acts, I mean, it's just resurrection after resurrection after resurrection. Just listen to a few verses there about resurrection in the youthful church in Acts. Acts 2 and verse 24, but God raised him up again. In Acts 2 verse 32, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Acts 5 and verse number 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you had put to death by hanging him on the cross. Acts 10 and verse 40, God raised him up on the third day. Do you get it? God raised him up. God raised him up. God raised him up. Somebody at your house ought to say amen right now that God raised him up. It is the message of the New Testament. So what was on Peter's mind when he sat at his home the first Easter morning? He had been to the tomb, no Jesus, and he went home, the Bible says, marveling at what had happened. What was on his mind? And today what should be on your mind and what should be on this preacher's mind on this Easter morning, 2020? I want to show you three things I believe that were on Peter's mind that day. And after I finish, I'm going to kneel in this altar and I'm going to pray for all of us. And this wonderful music group is going to come back and sing for us as we end our worship time on this Easter morning. But I want you to think with me today about three things I believe were on Peter's mind and should be on your mind. I know they are on mine today. Number one, I think Peter was thinking as he sat in his home, as you sit in yours, he was thinking on the promises of God. Look in our text back at verse number seven. Uh, while those women had gone there early, and those two angelic figures came, and they were saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. They were pointing back to the words of Jesus, to the promise of Jesus. We find it more specifically in Matthew 17, verses 22 and 23, where Jesus, Matthew records these words, And while they were gathering together in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were deeply grieved. Hear me. Jesus made the promise. He would fall into sinful man's hands. They would nail him to a cross. They would put him in a tomb, but he would not stay. He promised that he would rise again. This morning, you should think with me on the promises of God. Jesus made many promises. And I'd encourage you just to go sometime, uh, maybe to your computer and Google the promises of God. There'll be scores of them come up. And you can just read through the promises of Almighty God. I just want to give you four of them very quickly uh, this morning as we think about these promises. Jesus said, I will forgive sin. I don't know who all is listening today, but I want you to know that you, as well as this preacher, every one of us are sinners, and we need our sins forgiven. And Jesus said if we would come confessing our sin to him and believe by faith that he would forgive our sin and cast them. As far as the east is from the west, the Bible says he put them behind his back. He will forgive your sin. Number two, he promised not only to forgive your sin, but to forget, to forget your trespasses. He doesn't remember way back there. I've noticed this week because of high school seniors uh, uh, that they're not going to be able uh, to have the end of school. And uh, so people have said, in honor of the seniors, 
post a picture of your, your senior year uh, on social media. Put it out there. Uh, and uh, man, I, I, my wife asked me, are you going to do that? I said, I don't know. I've been trying to forget that for all these years. I'm not sure I want to remember that. I'm not sure anybody want to remember that. There's some things I want to forget. Well, let me tell you, friend, what Jesus does to your sin, he forgives it, and then he forgets it. He, he casts it away. He doesn't dredge that up as we try to. His promise is he forgives your sin. He forgets your trespasses. Thirdly, he says, I will never leave you alone. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus is with us in this coronavirus shutdown, difficulty, many losing jobs, being uh, just a tough day and having to stay in and be isolated, not being able to be at church. On, on, let me tell you, friends, Jesus is with you. Right where you are today, if you're a Christian and a follower of Christ, His promise is, I will never leave you. His promise is, I'll forgive your sin. His promise is, I'll forget your trespasses. His promise is, I will never leave you. Number four, quickly, his promise is, I will come again. Glory to God. He's coming again. The day is coming when Jesus will step out on the eastern sky and he is going to come and draw us like, like filings to a magnet. We'll be drawn up to him in the rapture when he comes a second time. It is his promise. His promises are true. Today, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you that you come and take Jesus by the hand and take him at his word and claim his promise that if you will come and believe by faith, he will by grace save you. I want you just to call on his name. You say, preacher, I don't think I, I oh yeah, you just need to do like the old hymn. I, I ran it off this morning, Brother John. I uh, just took this and it's an old song we used to sing. It's uh, written way back in the 1800s by Kelso Carter uh, called Standing on the Promises. I love stanza number two, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. You need to stand on that promise today that Jesus would save you, never leave you, and will come for you. But if you've never trusted him, I want you to pray. I, I'm going to pray a prayer right here at the beginning of this sermon. I, I'm going to pray, and if you've never prayed, ask Jesus to save you. I, I want you to pray right now and ask him to save you. If you need to come home to Jesus, I want you to pray and ask him to save you. Just, just bow your head. I'm going to bow mine. Close your eyes. I'm going to close mine. And, and I'm going to pray. And you pray in your heart words like these are exactly these. Are, just pray these words today. Father, I confess I'm a sinner. I know and believe that you love me, that you would save me. And I believe on you today. I receive your grace and ask you to come into my life. Forgive my sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, dear friend, if you prayed that prayer with me today, let me know. You can text me that answer. Just take your phone. 94,000 is the number, 94,000. Just put that in as the number and then text in the message the word Savior. Some of our people will be in touch with you. We'll get back to you. We want to pray with you. We want to help you. Week after week, we've had people doing that and encouraging them to follow after the Lord. Again, 94,000, and the word Savior. You just plug it in. The promise of God is He'd save you if you'd call on His name. Secondly, what was on Peter's mind there on that first Easter? Not only the promises of God, but the power. The power of God was on his mind. Now just think. Peter's sitting in his lazy boy, leaning back. He's in that little house wherever he lived. And he's contemplating. He goes back to the ladies that brought him this message. Who were those ladies? 
The Bible says in verse 10, it was Mary Magdalene. Secondly, Joanna. And thirdly, Mary, the mother of James. I, I can just see Peter as he, he thinks through, oh my goodness. If God can change them, he can change anybody. Mary Magdalene. Who was Mary? We learn about her in Luke chapter 8. The first two verses, we, we learn about Mary. L listen to it. Soon afterwards, he, he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And verse 2 says, And also some women who, who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses, Mary, who was called Magdalene because she was from the city of Magdala, that's where that comes from, Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons, had gone out. John Wesley says she was a harlot of her day. Demons in her life, and God changed her by the power of the grace of God. Peter's thinking, my goodness, if he can change that lady from the gutter, he can change anybody. But also Joanna was there. Who was Joanna? We, we learn from the Word of God that Joanna was married to Chusa, C-H-U-Z-A. Chusa was the steward of Herod, according to the Word of God. She lived in the palace. She was not like Mary Magdalene, down and out. She was up and out. Oh my, she had purple around her. Uh, she was married to this one that waited on Herod. And yet God had changed her life, and now she was helping with the ministry of the Lord Jesus. I'm just thinking Peter's looking and saying, Mary Magdalene, my goodness, the power of God. Uh, Joanna, my goodness, the power of it. Listen to me, friend. Today, Easter, I want you to think on the power of God. Jesus has the power to save anyone. Yes, indeed. He saved you. Jesus has the power to unite any division. Some of you sitting in your home today, you're listening with some people in your home, and you guys have been cooped up in that house. You've had a falling out. You've been on each other's last nerve. On this Easter Sunday, you need to go to that one and say, I'm sorry. Say, so, preacher, I don't think I can do it. Yes, the power of God will give you grace to do it. Some of you have had long grudges against other people. The power of resurrection can unite you and bring you back together. Don't you dare die living in that division. There's the power to save anyone. There's the power to unite any division. There's the power to restore any backslider. Some of you, you're listening. You, you wouldn't dare come in this room. But you click a button and, and spend Easter morning with us, and we are honored that you would be a part of worship at a place called Olive today. We want you to come here. You may, you may not feel comfortable, but we want you to know the door's open. We love you. And when we begin to meet again, we want you to come. But you say, Pastor, I'm I, I'm so wicked. I've gotten so far away from God. I used to go when I was a little boy, and I went to Bible school and camp. And I, uh, but I've just, the Bible calls that backsliding. I, I, I've just moved away. Hebrews says that you, you've drifted like a ship that's been untied from the dock, and, and you've just drifted away. Come home to Jesus today. Come home to him. The power of God is there to reach out, to take you, and to bring you home. I pray with so many people that are like this, that raised in the church, and they say, Preacher, I, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm, I'm just away from God. Come home to Him. C come home. I'm telling you, th there is the power to change your life. There's the power to save. There's the power to unite. There is the power to restore any backslider. Right there in your home, I challenge you, come to Jesus. And when you do that, if it's what you want to do, again, pick up that phone. Text me at 94,000, just the word Savior, and, and tell me, you're coming home to the Savior today. Let me know it. I, I need to hear from you today. You, you'll bless me. You'll encourage me, but we want to bless you back and encourage you. 94,000, that's the number. 
S-A-V-I-O-R. Just put that word Savior in. Let us know on this Easter morning, you're coming home to Jesus. Peter is there. He's sitting in his chair, and he's thinking on the promises of God. Hallelujah. He's thinking on the power of God. But now, quickly, I really believe what was pressing on Peter's mind more than anything was the process of God. The process of God. So Peter's there. You know his story if you've read the Bible very much. Just hours before this, he's told the Lord he'd go anywhere. He'd even die for Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, Before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And when they arrested Jesus and brought him in that courtyard, a, a little girl came to him and said, You were with him. He said, no, no, no. He denied him three times, and then that rooster crows. And Peter, the Bible says he went away weeping because he had denied the Lord. He, he's sitting in his home. It's, it's Easter morning. Jesus has gotten up from the dead. And Peter, the last thing he did was deny the Lord. What's going through Peter's mind? I'm telling you, I think in, in his head, what's the process for me to get back? How, how do I even find him if he's really been raised? How do I get home? What's the process? So Peter does what every good man in the South does when he needs to think on some stuff. The Bible says he went fishing. He got a boat and he went out fishing. And when he came to the shore, there was a man on the shore. His name was Jesus. And Jesus invited him and said, come have breakfast with me. And Jesus began to talk to Peter on the shore of Galilee. They sat down and they ate together. And he looked him right in the eye and said, Peter, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know I do. He said, feed my sheep. He said, Peter, do you love me? The second, Lord, you know I do. Feed my lambs, tend my lambs. Peter, now listen, third time's a charm. Peter, do you love me? Oh, Lord, I do. Then tender Tenderly, tenderly, tenderly look after my sheep. And then he said to him, when he got to chapter 21 of this text, he had invited him to breakfast. And in verse 19, he then looks at Peter and he says, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said these words to Peter. Follow me. Follow me. That's what Jesus is saying to you this morning. You know what the process is of getting back to God after you've failed? Have a conversation with him. He'll ask you this question. Do, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Do you love me? Listen now, do, do you love me? Yes. Then care for my sheep. Coming home to Jesus, two things are involved. First is personal surrender. You have to say, yes, Lord, I will follow you. And secondly, there is corporate ministry. If you're going to get serious with Jesus, you don't just step out and say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm following you. You take that step. But the next step is care for my lambs. That involves taking care of corporate ministry. Here, here at Olive, we invite you to come home and follow him. But dear friend, even when we can't meet, we're still in the ministry business. We are still the church. Just this week, we, we fed, I don't know how many foster kids. Chef Bob made up food for these folks that needed food, and we helped them. We're reaching out to widows during this time. 
some of the people most vulnerable. We're still doing that work. Out at our ministry village that's out back here, we, we keep that food bank going for people that are hurting and need it. And the church continues to go. The, the mission of the gospel continues as we share uh, in these services and other ways. Uh, Brother Mike, who's down our Warrington campus is still relating so much to uh, those uh, young sailors and military personnel. The mission goes on. If, if you follow him, then you care for his sheep. That's why your giving is so important to keep the church, both at Olive and around the world, going. We, we have things we need to do in ministry and mission that, that must carry on. Even when we're not gathered here, we're going there with the gospel. And so I want to thank you to my Olive family. Last week you were phenomenal. What an offering that you gave online and mailing it in and dropping it off. And some people calling and a few people went by and picked it up for them and, and brought it. You see, when you do that, the church is still the church. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, follow me. This morning, if you're ready to follow Jesus, one more time, pick up that phone if you hadn't done that yet. Go to your text message. Maybe you're an older person. I wouldn't even know how to do it. Well, if your grandson's there, he'll show, he show you how to do it this morning. Some teenage boy, 94,000, Savior. He would save you today. Just send us that word. We'll reach back to you and we will help you as you make that personal surrender and then get involved in corporate ministry. Some of you say, Preacher, I've been saved. I just want to join Olive. Good. Send me that 94,000 Savior. We'll get back to you. We'll let you join the church today. You, you're ready to come and much, put your membership here. We've had several do that in these weeks online of just saying, I, I'm ready to be a part of the family of God called Olive. Well, we'd love to have you as a part of our family. Text me. Let me know. Peter is sitting in his house and he's thinking the promises of God. Mm. He's thinking the power of God. Can God change even me if he can change Mary Magdalene? Oh yeah, he, he can do it. What's the process? How, how do I make these steps? And Peter finds breakfast and he finds an invitation. Well, today I extend that invitation for you to follow our Lord, unite with our family, and let's do together what God has called us to do as followers of the resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to come right here, and I'm going to kneel to pray. As I say often, this altar's filled Today, you may just need to kneel right there in your home. When I kneel right here, I'm, I'm going to pray. And after I pray, this wonderful group of singers, they're going to sing one more song. I think you'll love it. This is the best news ever, friend, that Jesus rose from the grave, and he invites you to come to him, to follow him, have your sins forgiven, and be a part of the family of Almighty God. I'm praying that you will send me that message at 94,000. You say, Preacher, I don't even know how to do that. Well, write me a letter this week. Let me know. Go online. You can find my text, uh, find my email address, and send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Just let us know that you've trusted Christ, and we'll reach back to help you. I'm going to pray. They're going to sing. And while they're singing, that'd be a great time to send that message during this song, and let us know that you on this Easter morning have answered yes to Jesus when he said, will you come and follow me? I'll pray here, you pray there, and let's do business with the King. Father God, I love you today. I thank you for your blessed word. And Lord, I thank you on this Easter morning that you are not in the tomb but you are on the throne. Thank you that you extend your nail-pierced hands to us, that if we will believe that you would receive us today, that you would forgive our sin. Oh God, I pray for Olive Baptist Church. God, help us in, in these unknown days. Lord, we're just learning how to do ministry in this mess. 
But Lord, you are your best when we are at our weakest. And we find ourselves there today. And we plead for your power, for your unction, your glory to be upon us. Thank you. You've entrusted the best news ever unto us. Bless these, my friends, that text us and email us and write us to tell us today they're trusting you fully. And I pray for them now by faith in Jesus' name. Amen.